Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to be taking a look at two fundamental parts of measuring audio, which are frequency and amplitude. Now, these are probably things you, you may already know, but this is something which I thought was important for me to have a video on the channel because in future videos we're going to be looking at things which are a little more in depth and I want to be able to point people back to this if they go, well, I don't understand what this, you're talking about, which... Uh, which sometimes happens. So we're going to be looking at frequency, just some basic elements of that, and also amplitude. And there's something about amplitude and uh, particularly listening levels, which you may not be aware of. So this is the kind of thing normally when I present it in a class situation, people go, oh, I didn't know that. So well, we'll get to that later on. But first, let's take a look at frequency. So here you can see I've got a Keybase project which has a few audio files uh, present. What I'm going to do is actually zip this up and make this available. So if anybody wants to download this themselves and listen to it, they'll be able to do so for reasons which become apparent after we've had a listen. I'm just going to open up the channel settings window so we can see as well as hear what's going on and then just play this. So. Uh, before I play this, please be careful with your listening level. So make sure you've got this at a comfortable volume for reasons which will become apparent when I play this. So this is going to be fairly loud. Yes, loudness warning on screen, etc. So just be careful with your listening levels and always err on the side of caution. Uh, you've been warned. Okay, so as that played, you possibly saw something happening at some points in that where you may not have been able to hear it. And there's a number of reasons for that. The first one is your hearing may not be perfect. So particularly as you get older, as we will see later on, uh, your hearing does degrade and you can't hear every frequency. So everyone's perception that would be different. But on top of that, there's a number of other factors. So firstly, this is being delivered via YouTube, which uses a lossy form of compression in both audio and video. So there's no guarantee that you're actually getting the audio that was sent originally to this. So that's one of the reasons. So that's one of the reasons why I'm going to make the Cubase project available. So if you want to listen to this in your own environment, you can do so. There's also the device you're listening to it on. So it won't reproduce every frequency perfectly, quite possibly, particularly, you know, if you're listening to it on a phone, on phone headphones, or on, you know, even not amazing speakers, no device will represent these perfectly. There's another reason on top of that why it may not have seemed to be the same all the way through, and that's because of a, a characteristic in our hearing. We are not equally sensitive to all of the frequencies in the same way. There's a curve which is available which shows that our hearing is much more sensitive in a certain range of frequencies than in others. So for instance when we were listening to around 1k that probably seemed a lot louder to you than when it was at the high frequency end and particularly more for everybody at the low frequency end. So the high frequency end was possibly missing to a degree because you might be old and grey like I am and your hearing may not be as good as when you were 10. Uh, but at the other end, that tends not to be for hearing loss. That tends to be because our hearing is less sensitive at that even if you are in a perfect situation. Now, that actually varies depending on the volume that you're listening to it as well. Uh, and I'm just going to put these curves up on screen. So these were originally called the Fletcher Munson curves, and they've now become an ISO curve, which has taken into account uh, more recent measurements. 
but they they actually show that our hearing is not equally sensitive everywhere. So if you've ever wondered why, if you when you hear a frequency sweep, etc., it seems much louder in that mid range sort of one to two k area. This is why because your hearing is more sensitive like that, probably because that's the kind of hearing that allowed us to find prey when uh, we used to do that kind of thing regularly to to survive. So our perception of frequency is is definitely not marred, but you know influenced by our our biology. So that's one element of it. Now the next element, which we're going to go back to Cubase for, is to do with our perception of frequency in terms of relative changes in the actual frequency that's happening. So let's take a look at that now. So here we are back in Cubase. Now I've got a series of waveforms on this track. So we're just listening to this track here. So we've got these. Now these are an octave series as the track gives the game away. So if I play this first one, this is going to be a low A. That may not be the best example, so let's try this next one because this one will probably be a lot clearer in terms of pitch. So there you have an A. And for the next A, we go from 110 hertz. So hertz is cycles per second. So if we were to count the number of times this alternates in a second, we would see 110 of them. And just for your uh, interest, all of the waveforms we're looking at at the moment our sine waves. So we can see this here, and this waveform is going to do this entire cycle. So from here to here, it does that 110 times a second, which is pretty quick. And that's the way that we measure that frequency in this case. So when we play that one, this is vibrating at 110 times a second. So whatever's making the air vibrate that's then hitting your ear is doing that 110 times a second, which is which is fast. However, the next one sounds like an A as well, and it's up an octave, and it's 220 hertz. So if we were to play an A on the piano, one of them would be 110 hertz, one would be 220. And you can hopefully hear that that's the same note, just up an octave. Now the next one, to get the next octave, we've got 110 and 220, so it might intuitively be well that would be 330 but that's not the case we have to double it each time to get the next octave so here it's 440 which is the next a and the next one is at 880 because again we have to double each time doubling again we get 1760 and then 3520. Now this next one is doubled. But the pitch of it generally isn't something that most people would say, oh, that's an A. It's got to the point where you think it's it's a very high frequency, but it's not something you can necessarily pick out as an A. And this next one. That's a doubling of frequency again. So we can see in terms of the numbers, this gets out of hand very quickly because we're doubling each time. It's like the old thing about the uh, if you put one grain of sand on the first bit of the chessboard, by the end of the chessboard, you've got all of the... You know, if you double on every square, by the end of the chessboard, you've got the entire universe or something. It's, it's an insane amount, certainly. If you double every time, you know, this is exponential growth. So every time it's doubling with every step. So that's the the next thing to take into account with our hearing is that the way that we perceive this isn't represented by a linear change in the numbers. So they say it's often our sort of naive expectation that if the first A is 110 and the second A is at 220, that the next one will be 330 because that's the pattern we may have thought was there. But, you know, just like those kind of number puzzles you used to get in maths classes, etc., it's not always the same thing, and you need more numbers to know how the pattern is progressing. In this case, our perception is that those changes are the same. So going from one octave to another is, is always the same change. But in terms of the frequencies, it's, it's not a linear change. It's a doubling each time. And that's something which is reflected 
in the next area we're going to look at, which is amplitude. But for the time being, this is something important just to take on board. And also it explains why when you look at a frequency response graph and when you look at spectrum analyzers, etc., why their scales aren't linear. Because at the right-hand end of that graph, where the frequencies are high, a small difference between one frequency and another, so let's say a 10 hertz difference, makes almost no difference to the sound. So you're not going to hear that much in terms of pitch. But if you go back down to the left-hand end and you've got, let's say, an A, and it's 110 hertz, if you change that to 120 hertz, it's a massive difference. So let's just take a look at that now. So here you can hear, firstly, 110 hertz. And then 120 hertz. And as you can hear, that's, that's a perceptible difference in pitch. You can tell those are two different notes. Now, let's go to the other end of the scale, as it were. So this one is 3,520 hertz, which is an A. And this one is 3,530 hertz. And as you can hear, the difference is negligible, if noticeable at all. So it's not the same effect because we are not dealing with linear amounts. Next up, amplitude. So amplitude is the measure of volume of a sound, the, the level, how big the waveform is vertically. Now, the unit for this is the decibel, and the decibel is probably the most overquoted and misunderstood uh, unit of measurement that there is. But at, at its core, uh, the decibel is just the relationship between two signals. So this is often a topic of confusion when people look at mixing desks and you see that zero isn't at the bottom, but zero is, is nearly at the top and is a level which people use a lot. So what that means, zero dB means there is no change in the signal. So the input is the same as the output. So that's why it's zero. If you've got a positive amount of decibels, it means that the signal is getting louder. And if you've got a negative amount, it means that the signal is getting quieter. Okay. Now, Decibels can also be tied to a particular reference. So when they're tied to that reference point, then they become an absolute level. So often you will see dB with another letter after it, like a U or an M or an A. And that means that that's an absolute measurement because it's the ratio between that perfect measured uh, calibration amount which is represented by the letter and the signal that you've got. So there's two different ways that decibels are used. So often it's like, oh, that's a lot of decibels, etc. But it's it's only kind of a lot if it's tied to a reference point. Uh, the analogy I often use is it's no good saying that I've got twice as much money or half as much money as someone else if you don't know how much money someone's got. It's just a relative thing. But if you say you've got half as much money as Bill Gates, that's a bit different than if you say you've got half as much money as Rab C. Nesbitt. So the, the point that you tie it to is, is really relevant. So generally, most of the time when you're talking about decibels in terms of mixing, you're just talking about the, the relative change in them. So when we look at Cubase's or any other doors mixer, zero dB just means that the signal hasn't changed level. Minus six means it's decreased a certain amount, and we'll see what that amount means later on. Plus six means that it's increased a certain amount. And it's only really at the very far end where we look at the, the signal level coming out that then we, we deal in absolutes. And the, the main thing to remember, we're not going to get bogged too much down in this, is that in a digital system, generally zero dB is the maximum signal that you can have. You can't go over that. Everything is in terms of negative. So that's why your mix downs, you're aiming for a, a mix down level, which is a negative number because zero is at the top. And in this case, is pinned to full scale. 
So that means you can't have any more than full scale in the same way you can't have any more than 100% of, of some figures. You can't give more than 100% effort, etc. Sorry, bugbear. Anyway, um, that's one of these things where after a while you, you get your head around it. But the, the relative change is important in terms of your understanding, but also there's a really important point to do with your long-term future in the music industry and your enjoyment of music, which we'll come to later on. But first, let's just look at some examples in Cubase where we see those relative changes illustrated on screen. So here we are in Cubase, and here I've just picked 440 hertz because it's clearly audible on anything, even the world's worst uh, smartphone speaker, as I demonstrated to myself earlier on. But it also means that we can see what's going on and hear it as well. So what we've got, I'm just going to zoom in. In fact, I'm going to get rid of the inspector as well. And we've got this track here. So this is the one we're concerning ourselves with at the moment. These are on the amplitude. Now, again, warning, please make sure your levels are down because this is the loudest signal that's going to be here. Possibly not in terms of perception because it's not a 1K or so, but it's definitely a loudest signal. So just make sure you're listening at a convenient level. This is 440 hertz at zero dB. So this means this is as loud as Cubase is going to output this. Now, if we reduce that by 3 dB, we get this. So you can hear that it's quieter, but not drastically so. So I'm just going to play through that without talking so you can get the full effect. And we can carry that on. So if we take it down by 6 dB, this is 3 dB quieter than this one, but 6 dB quieter than this one. So the difference between this one and this one, 3 dB, is the same as the difference between this one and this one. But we've got 6 dB of difference between this one and this one. So there is definitely a, a noticeable difference in volume. Now, what may surprise you is that 3 dB's change is actually a halving in the amount of energy which is present. It doesn't seem that much quieter, but it's half the amount of energy. So this is something we're going to come on to in a bit, which is the, the public health safety warning part of this and obviously from you know old man perspective etc but something that actually genuinely I've been, I was concerned about when I was in my 20s for reasons that I will go into uh, but our perception of it much like our perception of frequency is not maybe how you would expect our perception of amplitude is also not how you'd expect so while it's it's not linear it's it's done in a way which is a bit deceptive and I think it's a little bit dangerous in terms of its deception. So we're just going to listen to something which is a different change between them and then I'm going to discuss briefly why I think that's potentially a problem if you're not aware of it. I think if you're aware of it, it's fine. But let's just have a listen now. So here we have our reference signal again at 0 dB. Again, please be careful with your listening levels. And now we have a signal which is at minus 10 dB. So it's the same thing, just at 10 dB lower. And this is what generally people would say was half the volume of the previous one. Now, I know that's a pretty sort of vague thing to think about, but that's, that's why. So the, the unit is called the decibel. And deci means a tenth of. So that the difference between this and that is actually a bell because there's 10 decibels difference. So this is minus one bell. And the bell came from that perception of half the volume. So it's not exact, but it's it's certainly close enough to be approximate. And then if we go to minus 20, this is 
half the volume of that. So it's a quarter of the volume of that. So I'll play this and this, and then I'll play this and this, and then I'll play that one and that one. So let's just have those. And now the original and then a quarter of the volume. So that's the important part to take on there is that our perception is not in line with the change in the amount of power that's present. So we, we hear roughly 10 dB as a halving in volume. And if you have two halvings, that's a quarter. So minus 20 is a quarter of the perceived volume of zero dB signal. And this is where the, the, the danger comes in. And that's because we are not very good at really measuring how much energy is being received by our ears. Now, you may have seen this chart that I'm putting on screen at the moment. This is a chart to do with safe listening levels in workplaces. Uh, and that includes uh, everyone's hearing. So this isn't just that, you know, people who work in industrial settings, etc., are particularly susceptible. This shows that if you are exposed to noise for a certain amount of time, um, it can damage your hearing. So these are safe uh, hearing levels. So you'll notice that for every 3 dB that the sound level goes up, the exposure time halves. And that isn't something you would necessarily notice without measuring it with uh, you know, a sensitive piece of measuring equipment. Because as we've seen earlier on, 3 dB change in signal level doesn't seem like that much. It's not a drastic change. And yet it's a doubling of the amount of energy that's going into your ears. So I've just prepared something as a, a bit of a, not a wake up call, but something which is important to me, which is it's important that you don't listen to music loud all the time anyway, particularly when you're working. Uh, one of the things that happened very early on in my uh, career, I guess you'd call it, um, is that I noticed that people, when people listen to mixes loud in the studio where I used to work, when they came back to them the next day, they were never right. You know, they were on it, et cetera. And, you know, some of them used substances while they were mixing as well, which never, never worked well. But whenever they came back to them, they always sounded bad. And I experimented a bit with this, and I found that if I mixed at a low level, I made far fewer errors that I then needed to fix. And I, I, I think I've got a bit of a theory that I'm kind of lazy because I, or I have a good relationship with my future self, whatever. But I don't want to have to redo anything. You know, I don't want to have to do a job and then a day later redo it again because I've shonked it. And this is definitely a case where you you just can't get around the biology of it. If you're listening to things loud, your ears shut down and you will, if you're listening to it genuinely loud, you'll damage your hearing permanently. So public, you know, health tip, etc. If you're doing anything, get proper earplugs. Okay. They're not expensive. Okay. They're 140 quid or something for molded earplugs. That's not expensive compared to a lifetime of not being able to hear music, etc. I've always worn earplugs when I've been playing gigs, etc. I've got nicely done ones. If you're in the UK in the Musicians Union, you can get them cheap through the Musicians Hearing Health Service. And uh, they were 40 quid for these perfectly fitted earplugs I've worn playing loud, loud gigs on stage for entire tours. Ears never ring. You take your earplugs out after the gig. You can talk at a normal level, etc. You wear them in a nightclub, same deal. You come out, everyone else is shouting and you're like, yeah, my ears aren't ringing and so on. So do look after your hearing. But this this is the reason why. So I'm going to play you a few files and you can, again, listen to this at home, download the Cubase project from the link in the description and just think about what you're doing. And it's not a case you have to, you know, go totally quiet all the time, but you can't listen to it loud all the time. We're just not designed for that long term. So here we're just going to listen to the differences, which you think are almost nothing, and yet they halve the amount of time you'd be able to listen to it. So let's have a listen.
So with the sermon over, so what what we're going to do is on this final set of tracks here, I've I've just put these on. Now, these obviously are not calibrated in terms of the actual listening level that you're listening to them at. So don't turn this up. Please don't turn this up because you, the loudest one is going to be as loud as you've heard. So in fact, I'm going to just set this. So set your listening level from this and don't change the volume while you're listening to the rest of this. So here we go loud uh, sound warning level etc right so these are calibrated in terms of numbers of minus 3 db so for each one of these as we go back um, they are 3 db quieter so this one here if you had this set so your listening level was 85 db you would be able to listen to this for eight hours Now, this next one is 3 dB louder, which won't seem that much louder, but it's twice the amount of energy, and therefore you'd only be able to listen to this for four hours. And yet that really doesn't seem like very much different. And then this one is two hours. And this would be one hour. And this is probably the first time you think, oh, yeah, there's, there's a notable difference. So the difference between this, this you could listen to for eight hours. And this one you could listen to for one hour. Next one is 3 dB up again, so 30 minutes. Again, another 3 dB and 15 minutes. Another 3 dB, so therefore seven and a half minutes. And this last one, 3 dB up, and it's only three and three quarter minutes, so 225 seconds. I'm not sure about you, but one of the things I noticed when listening to these is it's very easy for this to sneak up on you. The, the 3 dB changes are not hugely you know, obvious, and you're certainly not aware that you've doubled the amount of energy which is going into your ears. And as a result, it could be very easy to hurt your hearing over a long period. So just be a little bit careful with that. You know, it's really obvious when you go out to a, a loud gig or a nightclub, etc. When you walk in, it's loud and, you know, you might need to take care. But it can sneak up on you if you just tweak the monitoring level as your working day goes on. And then you can end up listening to it uh, quite loud. So just be careful of that. And remember that it's going to mean you're going to make better mixes overall in the short term but also it means you're not going to go deaf in the long term which you definitely don't want because then it's not really going to be very easy to to work if that happens to you so that's my brief video on frequency and amplitude now we've only looked at sine waves for reasons that will become apparent in a future video uh, about waveforms and how they are created or deconstructed depending on your point of view We've just looked very briefly at it just to give you a bit of a grounding and so that we're all on the same page for things which will be happening in the future where I don't want to have to keep you know, going over and over the same thing because once you've learned you know, what the range of frequencies are uh, or what a decibel is and how decibels change your perception and the amount of energy that's in a signal, etc., we don't want to have to keep going over that. So in the same way, future basics videos are going to cover things like oscillators and filters in synthesizers. So then we could just concentrate on uh, the actual differences between them. That's the reason why I've made this video. So if you've watched till the end, well done. Thank you. Uh, and I say I hope you found it useful. And as ever, we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition.